So there's like the, the 1936 American Communist Party platform is available on the Internet Archive. I would go okay, read it. It's sure. interesting. It's awesome. Like it, you could take it and read it and go, hell yeah, we should do this shit. Like they're, they're all for like nationalization of the utilities and like making right. them held in the public trust and farmland should be held in the public trust. Like it's, it's all this really interesting stuff that like, yeah, I would love for this. <laughs> and the <laughs> other thing too is the way it runs. The other thing that's frustrating too, and you'll hear this from some people on the left that say like, well, we focus too much on identity issues. And we need to focus more on class. And it's like, look guys, go back to the 36 communist party platform. It has the, that blending of both yeah. thinking about marginalized people and fighting for them and those broader economic and class-based things. Because they understood that the two were intertwined, they went together. Yeah. So that's why they're calling for civil rights legislation. All right, we are live. I should be able to. Well, maybe I got to give it a minute, but. Uh, Hi, and welcome to Red Reviews, the podcast where we cover a variety of books from a leftist uh, anarchist perspective, a leftist, Marxist, and anarchist perspective. But we've got uh, on YouTube, Velkin999. Hello. Thank you so much for joining. Happy to see you. Thank you very much. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So. Yes. <laughs> we're back. We, we are off back. A, month. <laughs> a little bit of a hiatus. Yeah. So, you know, in the summer, I was dealing with being a little under the weather. We had to postpone some shows. And Corey, you were a little under the weather. We had to postpone some shows. How are yeah. you feeling? I, I'm better now. Yes. Yeah, so Good. I, uh, I guess about a month ago, I canceled because I was going through like what, a, I guess, an emotional funk. I was kind of hitting roadblocks mentally. And then two weeks ago or three weeks ago now, I got like really sick. And but I'm doing good now. That's good, man. That's good. And the thing is, is like, yeah, being sick sucks and it's no fun. But the one positive thing about being sick is that it does give you a little bit of time to be able to just sit and relax yeah. and yeah. kind of think things through and whatever. Um, and and I think that's always a good positive thing too. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm happy sure. to be back. I'm glad we're back. Last show of 2023. That's right. Going into 2024 very strong. We've got a bunch of shows lined up. We got, a, I think, a bunch of really interesting topics. It's a healthy balance coming into 2024 of stuff that viewers have requested mixed with things I'm interested in. And I know things that are Corey, that Corey's interested in too. So it'll sure. be a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, but tonight, um, we're kind of ending the, uh, the year with um, talking a little bit about history. And, you know, I'm a public historian by training, so I think that's perfect. So tonight, uh, earlier this year, we did the book The S-Word by John Nichols, which was a history of American socialism. And I liked that book, but I felt like it was missing things. I thought it was not an, an, it was a sort of an incomplete picture of, I think, the history of the American left. And I think that the book we're going to be talking about tonight is a great complement to that book because it fills in a lot of the gaps that that book had. So okay. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Paul Bull's Marxism in the United States, the history of the American left. Um, this is the third edition, um, which is substantively different than previous editions. It has like a new introduction and the, the, the conclusion chapter is completely rewritten. Um, and so um, Paul Bull, um, who is a um, Marxist uh, historian, he's written numerous books. Um, one thing that he does that's really, really cool is he's also a biographer um, and he uses graphic novels um, as oh, as his cool. of, as his medium to do biography. So he's written a graphic biography of of um, Eugene Debs. He's written a graphic biography of Rosa Luxemburg. Wow! Um, and so uh, he, he does. I think he's really doing something very interesting with that. And and I liked his book on Debs. I read that a couple of years ago and really liked it. Um, and so um, this book is, I think, really really great. Um, and I think it's like I said earlier. I think it's an excellent complement to John Nichols's book. Now, Nichols's book was, I think, kind of limited because it had some really good history in it, but it didn't have the same kind of theoretical grounding, right? And so this book does have that, where we're talking okay. specifically about the history of Marxism in the United States and all of its different flavors. Ah. And, it's and it's covering about 150 years of history. 
Wow. Um, so it's it's a much longer span of time in some respects than Nichols's book, although I think he goes back to the founding and talks about Thomas Paine. But most of his book focuses on like the 20th century and like the sewer socialists like right, Victor right. Berger. And, but his like he, he plays kind of fast and loose with terms in in his book, The S Word, whereas Boole kind of doesn't. He tends to be very clear about like these people were Marxists, these people were not. He, these people were influenced by Marxists, but never really claimed the title and so on. Okay. Um, as with all of these books, and this drives me nuts, and it drove me nuts about Nichols's book and this book. The one criticism I do have, there's not a lot about Debs. Um, <laughs> they kind of love to skip over Debs. It's like it's very weird <laughs> to me. I think part of it is it's because they know so many people have covered that ground that they don't want to overwhelm people with that. Because right. I was expecting because like there's a literally a chapter of this book called Marxism in the Debs era. Oh. But the chapter itself is not really about Debs. It's kind of just about the era in which he's in. Mm. And I think both authors do that on purpose as a means to say, like, we know Debs is important. But if you know anything about American socialism, you probably know who he is. So we're going to try to talk about some other people, which is fine. But I'm like, no, nah, you should really talk about Debs. <laughs> because right, I yeah. would argue, in my opinion, Eugene Debs is the most influential Marxist in American history. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think there's anybody... And I think it's very clear from reading him and understanding him that he was a Marxist. Like that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's unequivocal. I think you can get that history. And so I find it so interesting when people just sort of leap over him to talk about other things. And right. I'm like, he had so much more influence than a lot of these other people you're writing about. And it's no slight to those people, but like, why aren't you talking more about Debs? Right. Where's, well, where's the guy they all kind of were influenced by? They were all influenced by or they worked with or like shaped the history because he basically shaped the history of the American left for two decades. Yeah. Almost three. So like it's so important, but they kind of skip over it a little bit. This book does have, I think, certain things it focuses on that it finds interesting. Like Boole spends a tremendous amount of time talking about like the different ways in which Marxists in the United States developed uh, newspapers Okay. magazines and intellectual journals. He talks a lot about that. So his book is in some respects like an actual like practical history of like what groups did they set up? What did they do? But it's also intellectual history where he's talking about the kind of ideas that were circling around that were being that were influencing the different types of Marx Marxism that we would see in different types of people. Okay. Um, yeah. So we can. So that's kind of like a brief overview of kind of what I think about the book. I think it's very good. Um, I think it's better than Nichols's book. Um, I think it's more intellectually like rigorous, but right. you know, um, which is no slight to Nichols's book. I think it's a great introduction for people to learn about American socialism. Um, and he focuses on like, like the thing about that book is he focuses a lot of like a Philip Randolph and Martin Luther King and like the civil rights movement. Whereas Boole doesn't focus as much on that and talks about like other people. Ah, okay. Because those other folks were sort of tangentially Marxist, although A. Philip Randolph was very much a Marxist. Um, but King was kind of ambivalent about that. Ah. Yeah, we've got a comment from Vulcan, uh, 999. Whenever Debs isn't on the screen, the audience should be asking, where is Debs? Bingo. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think if you're writing a history of the American left from like 1890 to 1920, that story should mostly be about Debs. I mean, I, you know, and that's no slight to like other people, but it's, mo it should be mostly about him. You know, it should be mostly about him and it should be mostly about like the immigrant experience and it should mostly be about like the black experience and like writing about people right. like W.E.B. Du Bois. Yeah, for sure. Like, th like that kind of stuff. And he gets into some of that. The thing that I think is frustrating, the one thing I do th also think it's frustrating about this book, and it seems like I'm saying a lot of negative things, but I actually think it's quite good, is it, it is covering a tremendous amount of history and a very short no, short number of pages. This book's only like, I don't know, like 300 pages. So oh, he's covering 150 years of history in a very short span of, right. you know, span of length. Um, so he's like, it's sometimes it's a little scattershot where like he's like throwing a bunch of different things at you and trying to connect them together. And, okay. and while that's fine, sometimes the book gets a little unfocused and – it's just kind of leaping from things to things. Mm. Um, so sometimes there isn't a through line that kind of connects it all. That's where I think John Nichols's book is a little better, where I think he does have a little bit more of a narrative flair. Part of that's because Nichols is a journalist. Right. And I find that journalists often write, often write really good history, even if they don't always do very good history. And those are like two different things. 
Right. Cause like doing history is like the, you know, actually going through the, through primary sources and evaluating those sources and gaining conclusions and tying it to other scholarship. That's doing history. Right. Writing history is like writing a very good story based on historical resources. You know, a lot of good history is often written based on other historians work, which is right, fine. Right. Like, again, that's not a problem. It's just, that's the difference. So I think Boole is a better historian than Nichols, but I think that Nichols is a better writer than Boole is. Okay. That's kind I mean, of how I, I think right. that's kind of how I would say it. Um, that doesn't but I do seem think, like a harsh yeah. criticism. That seems okay. reasonable. <laughs> um, so, so that's kind of the overall, um, and then we can kind of get into the, the sort sure. of different. So I guess like the one through line that does kind of go through the book, and I think the lesson that we can take from it as being on the left is that um, one of the things we see in the, in the history of the American left over and over and over again is groups that sort of broaden, they create a wide net, they start to have influence, and then they sort of start to fall apart over sectional differences Mm. And begin, and then become obsessed with sort of sectarianism and being the correct doctrine, and then they sort of fade into a relevancy. And this happens yeah. time and time again in the history of the American left. Um, and I think that's a lesson to take, which is that I don't know the right answer to that question. Like right. whether it's the specific, like you know, what tendency are you versus you know what broader movement do you want to be a part of in terms of meaningful change, right? Because right, that's not right. an easy answer um, yeah. because sometimes you can make a tent so wide that it's kind of irrelevant. So right. that's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it, it, but also like you say, like if you start uh, dividing things up too much, then you have nothing but like groups of five people that aren't effective. Exactly. So this is the thing you see time and time again. And one place where I think that Bull uh, starts, that Nichols kind of starts with too, and you'll hear me compare those books a lot because I think they're companion books. I mean, they should sort of be read in tandem. Because I think if you read two of those, those two books together, you get a much bigger picture than you would if you read them separately. So this this episode is a spiritual sequel to the Nichols one. So I highly recommend people go listen to that and then listen to this or or listen to this and listen to that. But listen to them together to get a sense of where we're coming from. Right. Um. So we kind of really start in the 1850s. Um, a lot of this starts with immigrants. So okay. um, a lot of the socialist energies that emerge in the mid-19th century in the United States, and uh, there were sort of socialist, socialist experiments pre-1850. So obviously you have something like New Harmony, which was in my home state of Indiana, which was a utopian community that was set up by Robert Owen. Um, that was sort of a proto-socialism you do see different examples of these sort of utopian communities. The Oneida community was another one, which I think was in upstate New York. Um, these sort of utopian socialist communities, but they're not explicitly Marxist. Hmm. We start really seeing explicit Marxism on the American scene in the mid 19th century. And that largely has to go with three major groups. One is German immigrants. So okay. a lot of the German immigrants, and we probably talked about this in the show before, but 1848 is a very important year in the history of Europe and in the history of the United States, because that's um, when a lot of German immigrants start coming to the United States. So there's a mm -hmm. wave of revolutions that happened in Europe in 1848, um, which Marx and Engels were responding to with the Communist Manifesto, which was also published in 1848. They were right. trying to take advantage of those revolutionary energies that were happening in Europe, specifically in like Prussia and so forth. Um, so a lot of the immigrants who were these German immigrants or Swiss immigrants or Austrian immigrants who genuinely had these sort of radical politics but really couldn't stay in Europe because they were their their dreams of revolution were sort of unfulfilled because most of the the revolutions of 1848 didn't come to pass they were sort of a failed attempt. Right. Um, they came to the a lot of them came to the United States and they were sort of called the 48ers and a lot of them were people who said well we couldn't try that in Europe. Let's see what we can do in the United States. So the, you know, the, the German Americans are a huge component of the history of American socialism and specifically Marxism because they kind of bring Marxism with them. And we talked a little bit about that in the Nichols episode when talking about Civil War soldiers who were from German Germany who were sort of close to Marx or tangential to Marx right. who were explicitly influenced by Marxism. The second immigrant community that's really important is Eastern Europe. 
Um, and so they're very important starting in the mid 19th century, but especially in the late 19th century. So we're talking about, you know, Russians, Lithuanians, Poles, Czechs, okay. those folks, Eastern Europeans who were sort of learning Marxism through the, the presses of Europe and Germany and in France and so forth. And the third group that's really important are Jewish communities. So okay. they're the other larger immigrant group that are important as well. A lot of times with these early immigrant communities that explicitly had radical politics, that were more, some were more explicitly Marxist and some were not, they all tied their socialism to a sense of community and building community institutions. So right. this is where you get like benevolent societies. Um, you, this is where they set up their own banks, insurance companies, um, fraternal organizations, benefit societies that would help those in need. So it's like a kind of a form of mutual aid built upon them coming to the United States and kind of doing well. Okay. So, so in the mid 19th century, we still see the influence of Lincoln and the Lincolnian idea of the sort of, you know, the, the, it's, it's a petty bourgeois ideal, but basically that, that you would, you know, be a, a successful business person whose labor would be owned by yourself and you would be sort of a self proprietor and that like that kind of idea. Okay. So this is kind of melding in with some of these immigrant ideas about Marxism. And so they started developing, you know, their own working class organizations and specifically newspapers. So you see tons of different newspapers that are written in the German language press, the Jewish language press that are expressing these explicitly Marxist ideas. You know, you, this is where you get the Communist Manifesto published for the first time, which is in, in America in a magazine, ah. um, you know, and so and it's published, I think, either in whole or in parts. And, and so that was how people read the Communist Manifesto really in America for the first time, right. uh, unless they were a native German speaker. They read it in the news in these these weeklies or quarterly magazines. Um, and through this period, probably the first real theoretical Marxist to emerge was a guy named Daniel De Leon. Um, okay. He edited a newspaper called The People, and um, he sort of mixed Marxist concepts with evolutionary theory and like a, and like anthropology to create what what Boole kind of calls like universal laws of social development. So okay. we're seeing all these new things coming with the sciences, right? So I mean, so you've got the Communist Manifesto was published in 1848, On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin is published in 1859. So it's all that's all kind of going at the same right. time. Um, Engels himself was also very influenced by an American anthropologist. Um, so in talking about, uh, there's a short fragment that Engels wrote that's like like labor in the development of man or something like that. I forget what it's called, but basically he talks about how the early development of tools was an early form of labor, and that and how labor kind of built our evolutionary trajectory, which is kind of an interesting way to think about it. Okay. Um, so you have these different communities doing these different things. They start setting up their own organizations, but like a lot of these organizations we're going to talk about tonight, a lot of times they would sort of fall into sectarianism. Mm -hmm. So it was always about, well, we have the correct Marxism or we have the correct version of socialism and you don't. And so they sort of fragment, they sort of fragment into a relevancy. Um, and in fact, when Marx wanted to break up the working, when he wanted to break up the first international, um, he actually sent, like, he basically sent the head, the headquarters of the first international to the United States and that's where it died. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's, I think it's relevant that that's, that that's sort of the, the late 19th, the mid to late 19th century is a period where most of the Marxist energies are from immigrant communities with their mm -hmm. unique perspectives, either being German or being Jewish or being Eastern European. Interesting. And then when we get into start getting into thinking about what about, so that's like the immigrant experience. What about native born Americans? What was their relationship to socialism? Well, <laughs> it, America's always kind of weird. We always kind of <laughs> a weird outlier. Yeah. So part of, um, you know, part of Marxism in the United States for the, for those who are native to the U S and thinking about socialism one of the really big, there were really two large influences on this. Um, one was spiritualism. So in the mid to late 19th century, spiritualism was sort of a, a sort of a quasi-religious movement 
sort of dedicated to idiosyncratic or different ways of thinking about religion and spirituality. And so this is where you get people who are interested in like, I don't know, like talking people of the dead or like, um, you know, different planes of existence, you know, new okay. thought, you know, a lot of the sort of self-help stuff that we think of today, like the Tony Robbins or the secret or things like that. A lot of those have a genealogy back to the spiritualist movement. Mm -hmm. Victoria mm -hmm. Woodhull was a person who was involved in the spiritualist movement in the late 19th century. So you have this sort of spiritualist component that has a bit of messianism in it, in the sense that like the Messiah will come and save us and sort of bring heaven on earth. You have the other component of it, which is um, utopianism. So there's a, a very strong utopian streak through a lot of the native born American socialists um, in the mid to late 19th century, as they're becoming more and more exposed to Marxism. Because most Amer native born Americans were not exposed to Marx until the late 19th century. Mm. Um, and even then it was sort of limited. Um, and, and part of that's for a variety of reasons. I mean, part of that was that Marx, even in his own time was influential, but maybe not widely read in, you know, the way that most people for, for most, for most people who lived in the mid to late 19th century, if they were reading Marx at all, it was reading his articles in the New York daily tribune. Um, right. when he was a correspondent, like that's how you're going to read Marx. Most people weren't reading the manifesto. Most people weren't reading Capital. Like that was happen. That would happen later. Right. So the other part of it is you have the spiritualist movement. The other component of that for the native born is populism. Mm. Populism is a huge component to this. And I think like when we think about radical politics, radical American politics of like the mid to late 19th century, populism is a huge component of it. So what does populism come out of? Like today, when you hear the word populism, people often think of like Trump or like yeah. Bolsonaro. It's often a term of derision, um, often to describe right wing people. When in reality, the term populist was coined by the populist party in the United States in the 1890s. And right. they were explicitly a left wing movement. You know, some of them were influenced by Marx by way of having some of them being involved with immigrant communities. But a lot of it was that they wanted very strict controls on the economy. So like populist demands were often like bimetallism. So back then money used to be backed by gold. The populists right. wanted it to be backed not just by gold, but by silver. Okay. So they, there were free silver people who believed that money could also be exchanged for silver because silver was more abundant and cheaper for people to have. So it's mm. more of a working man's currency. Um, or an exchange, you know, for a foreign currency, what they call specie. Okay. Um, and uh, so you have that component of it. And then this develops into what's, you know, some of the early groups. So you have like, you have the, um, the Knights of Labor, which is one of the earliest large scale labor movements in the country. That then sort of evolves into the Populist Party broadly in the 1890s. Okay. And then the Populist Party really tacks on to... The Democratic Party in the 1896 election when William Jennings Bryan ran for the first time. So okay. Bryan was not a Marxist. I want to clear that up. Like he was a populist Democrat. But a lot of people who were radicalized, who were native born Americans, really glommed on to his form of political populism because he was calling for you know, bimetallism, you know, he was famous for giving the, you know, you, know sh you shall not crucify me upon a cross of gold, this, you know, cross of gold okay. speech that he gives. He was also fairly young at the time. He was in his thirties when he was running for president. Um, and uh, he doesn't win in 1896. Um, and the populist party kind of falls apart as a result. Um, it kind of splinters. They elect some local people, but in general, I think they may have elected a couple of people to Congress on the federal level. But the populist party kind of falls apart by the time you get to 1900 and its energies go elsewhere. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is the populist party probably had its most success in the Great Plains. So we're talking about like Kansas, Nebraska, you know, the sort of the far end of the of the of the Midwest and in the American South. It was very strong in the American South as well. Um, fortunately, the populism of the American South would then morph into the sort of right populism of the segregationists in the 1900s, in the 20th century. Um, so this is really the only part of the book where he talks, this is like chapter two. This is the only part of the book where he actually talks about dubs. 
Okay. So we're going to talk about Debs for a minute. So as I said earlier, I think Eugene Victor Debs, born in you know born in Terre Haute, Indiana, he's, he's a homeboy for me, um, is probably the most influential American Marxist um, in, in American history. Um, he starts out as a pretty rank and file Democrat. He actually serves as a Democrat in Indiana General Assembly. Um, he starts some. He he becomes involved in the uh, International Brotherhood of Firemen, which is um, the first sort of organization that he's involved in, labor organization he's involved in. And at the time, he wasn't that radical. Later on in the 1890s, he, he co-founds something called the American Railway Union, which is the ARU. And they lead a huge series of strikes in Pullman in 1894. I think we talked a little bit about this in the Nichols episode. Right. For our purposes, the one thing I want to talk about was that when he was convicted, um, of violating uh, the U.S. mails, of, of, of withholding U.S. mail. That was what they charged him with. Um, uh, he went to prison. And he went to prison, I think, for like a year. I can't remember exactly how much. But it's in prison he reads Marx. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what radicalizes him. You know, it's okay. not, you know. And so you know, people think, well, he wasn't really that much of a Marxist or he wasn't whatever. But it's like he was. Like he read Marx. He wrote about Marx. He did, he, you know, I think Debs was a lot more theoretically savvy than people give him credit for. Right. But what he does is he sort of takes two things and he puts them together to create this sort of unique brand of American Marxism. One is that theoretical underpinning, that understanding of Marx's key concepts of capital. And you take that and you put it with the populism that's developing through people like William Jennings Bryan and the Populist Party and all of that, and the language of like the moral language, not just making like the economic case for, for being against capitalism, but mm. making the moral case for being against capitalism. And you put those two together. Right. That is the synthesis of Debs. And that's what makes him important. Um, and so with that in mind, Debs ran for president multiple times. Um, he got nearly a million votes, not once, but twice in 1912 and in 1920. Um, and he got nearly a million votes in 1920 while he was imprisoned um, for speaking out against World War I. Um, so Debs is very, very important to the history of American socialism in sort of giving Marxism, in some respects, the sort of mainstream populist language right. that it didn't really have before. And sort of took it out of the immigrant communities, kind of took it out of some of the in intellectuals and made it something that people could really glom onto. The other part of that that's important, too, is that Debs is also one of the co-founders of the Industrial Workers of the World, which mm -hmm. is one of the first major unions in the United States to not just be for any profession where you could sort of be in any profession and belong to it, it wasn't specific to a trade. But the other part of it was that it was a multiracial organization. So okay. black folks were involved in the IWW, um, immigrant communities where Jewish folks were, women were involved. In fact, one of the co-founders was Mary Mother Jones, the labor organizer. Right. Um, big Bill Haywood was one of the was one of the big leaders of the IWW. He's got that right. great quote where he's like, "I've never read Marx. I've never read Marx's Capital, but I got the Marx of Capital all over me." You know. Um, and so it's this multiracial coalition that has this sort of welcome home in the IWW. This is where. Really, for the first time, socialism, specifically not just with the IWW, but with the American Socialist Party of Debs, you know, in 1900, 1904, 1908, 1912, like thinking about these elections, mm -hmm. you know, winning hundreds of thousands of votes nationally, um, winning seats in Congress, winning seats in state houses. Um, this is where you're starting to see them developing a big picture. But unfortunately, very much like with other movements before and after, it falls apart for a variety of different reasons. Right. One of them is that uh, they were deeply, a lot of the labor movement and working class movements were deeply divided on World War I. So World War I yep. begins in 1914. Um, the United States becomes involved in World War I in 1917. Okay. Um, and... Uh, at the time, you see what is basically the first Red Scare in the United States. So the U.S. gets involved in World War I in 1917. What else happens in 1917? Yeah, it's the Communist Revolution. Or exactly. The Bolshevik Revolution. It's the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, right? So you have these two events that have, have basically Wilson's White House scared shitless. 
So you so you have this situation where under the under the Sedition Acts, because they passed a new Alien Sedition Act under Wilson to basically strike to, to go after folks to stifle dissent. One of those right. was Debs. Debs gave a speech in Cannon, Ohio, in 1918, basically criticizing the war and 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 doing so not just on moral grounds but on First Amendment grounds. Like he's making his First Amendment argument of free speech. He's arrested under the Sedition Acts and he's given a 10 year prison sentence. He doesn't serve the whole term. He's let he his sentence is commuted in 1921 by President Harding, um, and he dies in 1926. Prison mm-hmm. basically never changes. It, it, it never Debs never recovers from his prison experience, especially uh. in regard to his health. So he kind of stopped being the, the the leader of the American Socialist Movement. The IWW kind of stall, starts to fall apart. Um, there's a general strike. There are mass strikes that happened in 1919 all across the United States. A lot of these start getting, you know, violently suppressed. And then a lot of people, they so the socialist movements are really broken apart by um, external suppression and that, uh, the, yeah. that the, the government is kind of cracking down on them, but also internal problems where they're, they're disagreeing on ideology yeah. and the left is becoming increasingly more militant. And not only is it becoming increasingly more militant, it's explicitly, explicitly becoming more and more Leninist. Mm-hmm. So before we get into that, I'll just kind of pause there if we have any comments or questions from our uh, viewers. Yeah, Vulcan 999 had a couple. Um, first one was, uh, that's the only thing I can give conservative org- organizations. They don't so much. They don't have so much sectarianism due to them running on bigot vibes. <laughs> that's, that's a really good point. That's a great point. And then uh, they said again, uh, what I'd give to have the American zeitgeist on communism erased so that they can get unbiased knowledge on it, like when the Communist Manifesto first hit the States. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean, the, I had a, a, a acquaintance of mine once describe it as like the anti-communist sentiment in the United States is like a background radiation. Yeah. It's just, it's just kind of there. And people often think that the anti-communist stuff starts in the 1940s and 50s. I'm like, no, it goes all the way back to the 1918, yeah. 1919 1920, like it's all then. Um, and it's not just, it's not just anti-communism, but it's also, they're not only going after an- communists, they're also going after anarchists. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you have like the wall street bombing, which was, was blamed. You know, you obviously have this Sacco and Vanzetti who were accused of it and they were innocent and they were, they were killed by the state. Like there's and and basically they were killed for the crime of being anarchists and using yeah. their first amendment rights to say so they were accused of a crime that they didn't commit. Yeah, and, the First Amendment yeah. hasn't actually applied to leftists for a long time. <laughs> Pretty much, no, it hasn't. And you could make the argument that it never really did. I mean, yeah. like, you know, and, and a lot of this sort of resentment or, or resistance to homegrown movements goes back to the founding of the American Republic. I mean, so before the Constitution, people – some people may not know this, but like before the Constitution, the United States was under a different form of government. It was right. under what was called the Articles of Confederation. And there was something called the Shays Rebellion. Daniel Shays was leading this rebellion against the federal – against what at that time was the government of the United States for um, – because Shays and his colleagues wanted to have more local rule and arguably they wanted more democratic rule. And the national government was like, nope. We want none of that because we got to pay off our war debts to France. Right. And so in 1787, and, you know, all of the, the, the founders of the Constitution, all the framers, when they met in, you know, first they meet in Virginia and then they meet in Philadelphia proper in 1787, um, they do it under the auspices of, oh, well, we're changing the Articles of Confederation. We're going to revise them. And they all get in the meeting and they go, no, 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 we're going to throw it out. We're going to start now. Um, so it, it already starts with deception. We're, yeah. we're already starting with deception. Because if the public knew that they were doing that, they probably wouldn't get away with it. Right. Um, and But anyway, so there's that. I wanted to also mention something about the first comment about like the right knowing how to organize. Part of that's because they don't believe in anything. Like, like you know, conservatives are reactionaries. They are only reacting to what other people actually believe. It's a lot easier to organize when you don't really believe in all that much. Yeah, because every time you get stuck on a thing, you can just throw your your values out. Pretty much. Yeah. Because the one thing that they get is that it's like long term, like they, they understand they're like, well, we have that. But the other thing too, is the right has all the money. It's yeah. all, I mean, they have all the corporate cash, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, 
like, you know, we on the left don't have all that corporate money to set up front groups. And like, you know, there is no Charlie Kirk of the left because there's no billionaire funding Charlie Kirk of the left. You know what I mean? Like, so it's tougher that way too. Yeah. And every time somebody who's kind of a left ish gets successful and money and power, they all seem to abandon their. (laughs) Yeah. Or it's either they abandon their leftism or you recognize they never had it to begin with. So like, you know, uh, and that's, and that's often happens. You know, you don't, you're not going to go in there and change the, the, the democratic party. The democratic party changes you. Right. Yeah. And and that's what people need to know. I mean, this is the thing, like from the history of the founding of the Republic, like, you know, the Democratic Party goes back to Jefferson. It's it is the party that mostly rules. And the Republicans, because people think like, aren't the Republicans in control of everything? It's like, not really. I mean, the Democrats are generally mostly in control. I mean, they have all the major cities. They have the most populous states. You know, they often have most of the federal civil service, like most of them are Democrats, or at the very least, they vote Democrats, they can't vote Republican. Republican Party from its very beginning has been an insurgent party. It was it was it was the party of the left in 1860, when it nominated Lincoln for the presidency, it was the insurgent party that was the anti slavery party, because the Democrats were pro slavery, and they were pro status quo. They were the conservatives. Um, so and it's, still the conservatives and, and they're still the conservatives, <laughs> right? They're way over on that other side. And yeah. I made a post about this a couple weeks ago and I'll say this again. So, you know, I, I, I've talked at nauseum about Gore Vidal and we are going to do a Gore Vidal episode next year. Um, but he, I think one of his most keen insights about American politics is that the, the liberals are actually the conservatives and the conservatives are actually the reactionaries. Yeah. And I think once you understand that, American politics start to make a hell of a lot more sense because yeah. there is no real left. Yeah. You know, the Democratic Party is not the left party. You know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. you know, as he's, as he's also, as, as he once said too, you know, the United States has one party. It's the property party and it has two right wings, Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, so there or, isn't uh, a, yeah. Two heads of the same snake. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yep. E- exactly. And I think that's what people understand is that bourgeois politics you know, capitalist politics are there. There's a, a certain limitation on it, um, which uh, I think segues really into talking about um, the emergence of Leninism in America, because I think it's a great lesson in learning about the limits of this, the limits of sort of engaging in capitalist politics. So when Leninism really came to the United States, it, it came in a couple of different ways. One, it came through Trotsky because Trotsky was very involved in the U.S. and the U.S. left for many, many years, even before the revolution in, in Russia in 1917. He even lived in the United States for like a okay. hot minute in the 1910s before he went back to Russia, um, which I think is fascinating. Um, and uh, so so, um, so it comes that way. But the other part of it is it's the development of the American – of the, the, the Communist Party of the United States, CPUSA, uh, which was founded in 1919. Um, and it was an offshoot of the American Socialist Party. So by 1919, the American Socialist Party is pretty much out to lunch. It's done. Mm. Like Debs is in prison. Everything sucks. Like we don't really have anybody. Yeah. It was in the interregnum between Debs and Norman Thomas, who would become sort of the leader of the American Socialist Party in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, who would be a okay. very influential force. Um, so you have the Communist Party founded in 1919. It has many different leaders. So you have somebody like William Z. Foster, who was a labor organizer. He's probably far more of what you would think of as like the militant wing of the American yeah. Communist Party. So he's less sanguine about like, working with capitalist parties. Right. But in the 1930s, as you see the rise, the emergence of the of fascism of American, you know, you, you see emergence of fascism around the world. The common turn, which is the name for the third international, which was founded in the Soviet Union, um, kind of gives a diktat from on high that like, well, we kind of have to start thinking about this differently. Now, Bull reads this history a little differently than I do. Okay. So, and there's different ways of reading this, and I will admit that part of my knowledge of this is also influenced by Arthur Schlesinger, Schlesinger who's a super bourgeois historian, so okay. take that with what you will. I would imagine the truth is somewhere in the middle. Boole's contention is like, well, the, you know, the, 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 
the, the, the Russian, the Communist Party of Russia didn't have any, really anything to do with the American Communist Party, didn't really care, it wasn't that involved. Schlesinger's like, no, that's not true. Like they, they often gave them money, like they often gave them support, certain, di- like certain directives. Um, and so, especially at the time when George Dimitrov, who was very involved, so uh, in, in the Soviet side of it, so I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle where like a lot of rank and file members of the American Communist Party probably didn't really know that much about Russia or give a shit. Right. But, but the leadership probably leadership. was connected and like say got some directive because I mean, I thought it was pretty well established that the Soviet Union had connections to various communist parties around the world. Yes. And would like, I think especially in like Spain, uh, they were directing the the Communist Party in Spain. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So this is without a doubt. Do I think that that the Soviets were as in control of, of the United States as they were Spain? No. Probably not. No. But. but what I do think is that one of the big ideas that the Soviets had that kind of got brought down to America, that America really took to heart, was the idea of the popular front. Mm -hmm. So this is something we've talked about before. I think we talked about it in our sort of left solidarity session stream we did a year ago or whatever, a year and a half ago now. Right. Um, You know, starting in the 1930s and 40s, especially when the Communist Party of America was 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 led by a guy named Earl Browder, um, uh, who ran for president under that, I think, in 36 and I think 40. Um, His 36 run is pretty interesting because. It's the 36th run that he, he his vice presidential running mate is John W. Ford, who was an African American, okay, um, whose parents were slaves, and he grew up as a sharecropper in Alabama, and became and moved up north during sort of the Great Migration, um, and became a labor organizer, um, and then became involved in the Communist Party. The Communist Party platform of 1936 is awesome. <laughs> I can't <laughs> I can't stress this enough. It's like fantastic. So. They're calling for civil rights legislation literally a generation or two before it happens. Right. They're calling for collectivization of agriculture and like, you know, they're, they're advocating for what would later become, you know, Social Security. Like they're doing all this really interesting stuff. So there's like the, the 1936 American Communist Party platform is available on the Internet Archive. I would go okay. read it. It's sure. interesting. It's awesome. Like it, you could take it and read it and go – Hell yeah, we should do this shit. Like they're they're all for like nationalization of the utilities and like making right. them held in the public trust and farmland should be held in the public trust. Like it's it's all this really interesting stuff that like yeah, I would love for this. <laughs> and the <laughs> other thing too is the way it runs. The other thing that's frustrating too, and you'll hear this from some people on the left that say like, well, we focus too much on identity issues. And we need to focus more on class. And it's like, look, guys, go back to the thirty six Communist Party platform. It has the that blending of both. Yeah. Thinking about marginalized people and fighting for them and those broader economic and class-based things because they understood that the two were intertwined. They went together. Yeah. So that's why they're calling for civil rights legislation. That's why they're calling for, you know, the, 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 the sort of getting rid of, rid of Jim Crow, essentially a generation or two before it would actually right. in some respects happen formally. Yeah. Um, so the popular front really is – in the 1930s and 40s, the American Communist Party kind of softens its tone. It stops being as confrontational with mainstream political parties, and it mostly sort of ascends to the New Deal um, okay. and Franklin Roosevelt. So when when Browder was running in 36, he really ran for two reasons. One, to sort of grow the stature and promise the Communist Party, but also to basically run against the Republicans – um, and hoping that, like, if they were going to peel voters off, they would peel voters off from the Democrats and not from the Republicans and not the Democrats. Mm-hmm. So he's so, and and so in the United States, the Popular Front mostly manifested itself that way, where it was n- not being openly antagonistic to, to FDR and the New Deal, and actually being a lot more like um, conciliatory to it and kind of uh, working along with it. So this is where you see a lot of that. Okay. By the time that you get to World War II, which is kind of its peak, so, you know, and this is where you, like, the CIO, and and the CIO was very heavily Congress of Industrial Organizations, another large trade union that develops out of the AFL, which is the American Federation of Labor. The AFL, from its very beginning, segregated and was only white folks. 
CIO tends to open itself up more to African Americans, and specifically, the CIO has a lot of leadership that are from or from or adjacent to the American Communist Party and the American Socialist Party. So like, there's okay. that. This all starts to fall apart by the nineteen mid nineteen forties, basically after the war. Um, and I think you know this is where you get the second Red Scare. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and it happens really in two ways. Um, so you have the Red Scare, um, which is, you know, at this time you have the development of loyalty oaths. So when Truman, President Truman required loyalty oaths for federal employees, that they had to explicitly say their oath, their allegiance to the United States and not to communism. The other, at the same time, <laughs> I know. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with this? <laughs> I know, right? What's so interesting, right, is so these people are very critical of like the Stalinist trials of the 1930s. Yeah. But in some respects, we did the same thing. It was just called HUAC, the, you right. know, the House on American Activities Committee, and its, and its companion committee in the Senate, which was led by Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin, Yeah. Um, who said, like, I have a list of these communists in the government, and the number would change – Basically, by his mood or whether or not he was drunk that day. Because he was a liar. Because <laughs> he was a lying, drunken <laughs> scumbag. Um, but uh, but yeah, so the the Red Scare – and then the other part of that is what's called the Lavender Scare. Um, right, right. And the Lavender Scare is when they go after people who are suspected of being homosexual. So because at the time, they sort of saw homosexuality as being deviant. Well, what else is being deviant? Being a communist. So they sort of, they make this leap that basically any homosexual can either be blackmailed by a communist because like, you know, it's either you support what we want to do in the party or we'll expose you to being gay or they actually are gay and they're involved in the communist party. So, uh, so this is really where the communist party starts to go into irrelevance. Earl Bratter is very unceremoniously thrown out of the party for being too sort of conciliatory to the new deal William Foster gets back into power and it goes into irrelevancy. Um, so that's where we'll leave it. And then on that part, and then we can start talking really about the last part, which is the new left. Um, but before that, we can stop hey. for comments. Yeah, we got uh, um, non has uh, joined us over on Twitch. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, <laughs> Velkin uh, on YouTube said, I mean, the Pledge of Allegiance is just as weird. <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> yep, I agree. It is. And uh, Velkin also said, uh, we got to get the pinkos out of Hollywood. Yes, that's right. So that's the other component of it, too, is going after writers and actors and directors who were, you know. And so this is where, you know, Ronald Reagan becomes sort of nationally prominent because he's the head of the Screen Actors Guild at the time and basically rats a bunch of people out. Uh, uh and sort of so his scumbaggery starts way way before he right or and, governor of california uh some random geek says sorry i'm late well, that's all right that's all right <laughs> you can always weird. catch what you missed after the stream um or you can see the super fancy version that Corey like edits later yeah um, in six months yeah. when i finally <laughs> <laughs> well thank you anyway for joining we really appreciate it i do want to make a quick comment about the pledge of allegiance yes it uh, is very strange yes but the Pledge of Allegiance was actually written by a socialist, a Christian socialist um, in the 1890s. And the original pledge had nothing about God. Um, in the United, in, here in Indiana, we have a war memorial that was built in the 1920s for World War I veterans. There's a temple that's on the inside of it. You read the Pledge of Allegiance in there, it's as it was originally written. So it doesn't have under God in it at all. Right. Um, and I think it used to be like, I pledge allegiance to my flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, the, for which it stands like that's added later, you know, and the under God stuff is added in the 1950s. Um, It's a part of the Red Scare. scare, Yeah. 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 Same within God. We trust on money that was added during the Red Scare in the 1950s. Anyone who uh, follows us from the old atheist community would should know that. (laughs) Yes. Um, And the other thing that they start doing in the 1950s is the national prayer breakfast happens starts in the 1950s. Eisenhower is the first person involved uh, as first president involved. Um, and the other thing that they do is the parsonage allowance, which is to uh, provide tax-free housing to clergy, which mega pastors take advantage of. So like Nancy, what's, what's her name? Joyce Meyer has like a $10 million home with a golf course. Right. She doesn't pay property taxes on that. 
as a part of the parsonage allowance. Yeah. So the last time in America before like basically the last 10 or 15 years where the left had, I think, continued vibrancy and, 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 and sort of relevancy is in the 1960s um, and the 1970s. And this is where you right. get the new left. Um, so to do as a preamble to the new left, there's sort of, there's sort of proto folks who are sort of influential in the proto left or not, they're not on the new left, but they're not of the new left. So like okay. an example of this is like CLR James, um, right. CLR James okay. features a lot in this book. Um, I don't want to go into it too much, mainly just for time, but also because I, so we at some point will do a CLR James episode. Um, right. And we uh, sort of talked about CLR James at other times. Like, yep. so. so he was really involved in the development of a sort of uh, a non-Stalinist Marxism in the 1940s and 50s. He was very involved with organizing UAW workers in Detroit who were organizing on sort of black solidarity, but not in the sort of black nationalism that we would see later in like the new left. Mm -hmm. um, but so, and he was really involved with, with a bunch of other writers like Grace Lee Boggs and, and Raya Dunayevskaya. So there's that influence. Like CLR James is very influential on this stuff. Obviously Marx, Lenin, Mao, like all of like the, the, the you know, the Mount Rushmore of Marxism. They're all, <laughs> the, all, the new left. all the big names. All the big names. So the new left is very much a response to the old left. And the old left we can largely define as like the 1930s, 40s, popular front, you know, right. socialist politics. The politics of, say, Earl Browder, Bill Foster, or Norman Thomas. Um, and uh, the new left really starts in the 1960s. It's sort of first shot across the bow is, is often uh, – this, uh, is often referred to as the Port Huron Statement, um, which okay. was written by uh, a group called Students for Democratic Society. So you had a lot of different organ, you had a lot of different people involved in this group, including Tom Hayden um, and others. So you have the Port Huron Statement, which is this uh, very explicitly sort of anti-Stalinist left manifesto. Um, arguing for a more authentic, genuine politics that leaves behind the authoritarianism of both extreme capitalism and state socialism like the Soviet Union. So it's trying to sort of create a new lane for socialist politics and radical left politics in general. But it, but the Port Huron Statement and SDS in its early years is not as radical as it would become later. Um, but SDS has some influence mostly in the early 60s, early to mid 60s, with um, with the free speech movement. So you have the Berkeley free speech movement, University of California, Berkeley. One of the leaders is a guy named Mario Savio. If you ever want to see a video to inspire you, you should look up like Mario Savio's speech, like 1964. And he says, you know, uh, he, he has this great speech where he's like, you have, to, you have to grab upon the gears and upon the levers and you have to like – it's this beautiful speech where he basically says, you have to shut this shit down nice. in order to change it. Um, and so you have these sit-ins, you, uh, they're fighting against administration policies, which they see as being antithetical to academic freedom. Um, while all of that's going on, you also have the civil rights movement. Mm. And we talked at length about the civil rights movement. What I'll briefly mention here is that, there is an influence of Marxism on not just Martin Luther King, who read Marx and interpreted Marx, I think, very much in the sort of Marxist humanist tradition of people like C.L.R. James and others. But the people around him are also influenced by Marxism, specifically Bayard, Bayard Rustin, um, the organizer, um, who helped King substantially with LCLC in the early days. Um, and unfortunately, Rustin, and I think there's actually a new movie out about Bayard Rustin, which okay. people should I haven't watched yet, but I, I've heard it's very, very good. Um, but one of the things about Bayard, Bayard Rustin um, was that he was gay. Mm -hmm. And that kind of limited his ability to be involved. And in fact, um, you know, King kind of stuck up for him when others wouldn't, um, precisely because. But his, his sticking up for him could only go too far. and could only go so far. And in the previous episodes, we talked about A. Philip Randolph and the March on Washington, the Poor People's Campaign and all that. So yeah. check that out. But so the new left then starts to kind of evolve. So by the time you get into the late 60s and the early 70s, the new left kind of sheds its more idealistic form 
and becomes more radical and militant. So we're noticing a theme again where right. organizations kind of start big tent. They're more idealistic. They're more ideologically heterodox. And over time, they become smaller, more sectarian, more ideologically um, orthodox. And as they become more like that, they become more relevant. So he talks about the book about how when SDS met in, I think, 67 or 68, uh, you know, basically you have certain leaders of SDS fighting over who's, who is actually the real Marxist Leninist. And, right. and they start having this very like sectarian um, uh, fighting. And unfortunately this pretty much leads to the dissolution of SDS. Um, mm. And it becomes pretty much irrelevant by the early 1970s. It kind of peters out. Um, there was a revival of SDS that happened about 15 years ago. And unfortunately it kind of made all the same mistakes that the old SDS did um, and sort of became irrelevant too. Um, so as they're becoming more militant, you're seeing more and more different splinter groups developing. So this is where you get the development of like the Workers' World Party, WWP, which is explicitly like Marxist-Leninist. You have the Maoist influence. We can also talk about sort of the uh, Black Power Movement. Um, so sort of rejecting the sort of nonviolence of King, and the sort of coalition building of King and explicitly being more, you know, uh, uh, black nationalist. So it's where you get the Black Panthers, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, uh, yeah. arguing, arguing for a more explicitly black uh, working class politics. Yeah. Um, and Bull is a little critical of them, um, as has been Adolf Reed. We're going to do. Uh, Adolf Reed next year, we're going to read his book, Class Notes, which I think is okay. excellent. Um, that was a book that Michael Brooks was very influenced by, as am I. Um, and so, you know, what, for all the strengths of the Black Panthers, its sectarianism was, in some respects, its downfall. But its downfall was also due to the U.S. government. Yeah, the them. FBI. It was like... So the FBI killing Fred Hampton yeah. and, 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 you know, because a lot of, and, you know, and a lot of those guys either ended up dead or they ended up in prison, like Bobby Seale, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so it, it kind of had its own limitations. He For argues sure. that the new, new left's probably biggest influence or its longstanding influence is actually in feminism. Um, okay. so, uh, so in this discussion, I haven't talked a lot about women, but women yeah. become a very key part of the new left. Um, and their influence is really deeply felt, um, in the 1970s, as you see, 60s, late 60s, early 70s, you see the development of women's studies programs. You see the work of people like Angela Davis, Women, Race, and Class. That's an episode. We've done that book. Go check yep. that out. Um, and also sort of the emergence of um, the LGBTQ movement. Um, this all kind of comes out of the new left, you know, right. and, you know, sort of precursor to the new left for the LGBTQ community was the Mattachine Society. Um, um, which was set up by a communist. Um, f f it was a sort of radical, militant, you know, gay rights group. Um, and so the new left's largest influence is sort of breaking away the old sort of Stalinist strictures of Marxism and sort of mm -hmm. giving it a new life and breathing into it a sense of uh, spontaneity and a sense of humanism and sort of reviving the relevancy of the, the role of Marxist politics in the 20th century. And while the new left petered out, its influences are felt all over. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of the people that we read today are products of the new left, including, including Paul Boole himself. He was mm -hmm. of the new left. Um, people like David Harvey or Tariq Ali or... Right. Um, a lot of these people, they're all products of the new left. And so, you know, and the new left probably has a lot of influence in the creation of Verso Books, which published this book. You know, it came out of Monthly Review, which mm -hmm. was preeminent new left Marxist journal that developed in the 1960s and 70s. So theoretically, very rich time. But in terms of politics, it only had sort of peak moments, you know, yeah. like the SDS or the free speech movement or in 1968 um, and May 1968 in France and how that would influence events here in the U.S. Um, a protest against the Vietnam War, which are obviously a huge component to the new left. Um, and, 
you know, a lot of them organized around fighting against the war. Um, and I think that was one of the new left's challenges was after the war was over in you know, as the war was sort of formally over in 1973, final U S troops leave, um, in <laughs> horrific defeat in 1975 and the country's unified under the, under the communists, uh, you know, the left kind of doesn't know where to go and it kind of peters out. And so, the, and so to sort of, as a quick coda, we'll talk a little bit about the last chapter of the book. Um, but before we do that, we'll stop real quick for, for comments and questions. Sure. Yeah. We, uh, uh, the most recent one is nonsequently saying, I didn't know you guys did women, race and class. Looking forward to checking that out. Oh yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, we did that one early on. I love Angela Davis. I think she's awesome. Um, and I think women, race, and class is an essential read. So definitely check that out and read it if you haven't, because uh, it's I think it's really, really good. I think that she gets a lot of credit for being a great historian, but she or, or, or being a great activist, but she's also a very, very good historian. Yeah, um, sure. she's really good at doing history. So I think that reading her work because that's what that, most of that book is just history, um, where you learn about how deeply racist the American suffrage movement was and. Uh, a lot of the eugenic policies that were inflicted upon black people went well into the 1970s. And I mean, the role of domestic labor, um, I think, you know, penetrating insights um, that are, I think, really relevant continually. And I, um, I also think she's got a new book out. Um, okay. I, I forget what it's called, but she's got a new book out. But um, cool. yeah, she's great. And yeah, thank you for hopefully checking that out. And uh, it's a little bit wa little while ago, but uh, some random geek also said, "Don't forget about May first uh, becoming yes. Loyalty Day." Yes, yes, it did. Well, and the other thing too is that so Labor Day in the United States goes back to Grover Cleveland, right? So, and this is the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. They so I think it's like the second. It's either the first or second Tuesday of September. I think it's the first Tuesday of September is Labor Day in the United States. To explicitly separate it from right. May Day, which yeah. is the real Labor Day. Yeah, um, but you're absolutely sure. right. That is Loyalty Day. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's like 9-11 is now Patriot Day. It's, I think it's right. what it's too. And Velkin, uh, again, this is a little older now, uh, said that that sounds a little better. I knew about the Under God stuff, but not the other stuff regarding the, uh, uh, Declar or the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. And if I remember right, I mean, a lot of it was, it was like developed for like a public event and then it sort of became a thing. Right. Although you're going to be pretty, it's pretty harrowing to see, like, if you look up kids doing the Pledge of Allegiance before <laughs> like, say 1940, uh, I, you know, check out those pictures because uh, they're pretty, they're pretty like you, your jaw will drop. Uh, but because they didn't used to put the hand over the heart. They used to do something else, <laughs> which I'm not going to do here because we'll get demonetized. So. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty yeah. weird stuff. Definitely, definitely weird stuff. Um, so I think, you know, I think that the story of the American left and specifically the, the, the left that's been influenced by Marxism is very much about growth and sort of disillusion and regrowth. And so I think in some respects, we're kind of in a regrowth period, although you can make the argument that the growth is kind of over. Um, I know that Chris Catrone, who's a writer I like, has said the millennial left is dead and like we have to move on and uh, try something else. But I don't know if that's I'm true. I'm not convinced, but okay. I, I'm not convinced. <laughs> but I think that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the anti-WTO protests in 1999 in Seattle, the emergence of the Occupy Wall Street movement, Corbyn's success in Britain, you know, Bernie Sanders' success in the United States, the emergence of the DSA. All these are positive things, even if they're not completely our own politics. Like DSA yeah. are not my politics, but like right. but then a lot of the more harder left like parties, like PSL, which I used to be a part of, is like that's not like my politics either. So I kind of fit nowhere. Yeah, like I, I'm kind of on the page where like uh, left politics needs to stay around. Yes. And, and if any of these groups has some success, then we ought to be happy with that and, yeah. and, you know, make ground where we can. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And I think that, you know, because, and I think that's the lesson of the right is that the right are far more willing to sort of let certain things slide for bigger goals. Right. And the left isn't good at that. Uh, at least the American left is not particularly good at that. 
But part of that is that the, the, the emergence of an American left has always been very difficult. And it, and that goes back to the founding of the country. And that goes back to the, the 19th century that like yeah. you know, the United States has always had a left, but it's never, but it's never been of the left. If that, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it's yeah. so I think that, you know, I'm very much of the mind that the way that we kind of build power is through the emergence of labor unions. I think you've seen the success of labor unions over the last few years. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, that's, I think that's a huge development that's going to be good. And I think it's going to be good for political power too. I think the other thing too, that the broader left I think needs to do is break up with the democratic party. So, this is where I am going to sound a bit sectarian, but I think it's for an important point, which is that if you're building institutions that are separate from the Democratic Party, I think that's a good thing. Mm. Um, and I think that uh, even if I don't, might disagree with some of your individual politics or whatever, but like the fact that you're building serious left organizations that are trying to either influence the Democratic Party to be better or to basically give the Democratic Party the middle finger and kind of do their own thing. Yeah. I think that's good for politics too, because the New Deal didn't happen just by virtue of FDR's like magnanimity. It wasn't because he was uh, nice. Yeah. It was because there were these militant groups that existed. You know, you had the American Communist Party, you had the American Socialist Party, yeah. you had uh, militant labor unions that went on strikes continually throughout most of the New Deal. So, you know, you you had this vibrant left that actually made a difference. And I think we're going to get, hopefully, I think we're going to get in a place to do that. I mean, I think that, you know, are we in a bit of a dark period right now? I would say, yeah, I think we are. I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I think that, you know, uh, I think the fact that, that, you know, we have a, a Biden administration, which is, you know, continually, you know, supporting vicious, uh, right-wing governments and yeah. their horrific crimes against people um, <laughs> is is a testament to that maybe we're not where we need to be. I yeah. don't think we're where we need to be. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Velkin says, uh, remember to have your labor contracts end April 30th, 2028. 2028. Yes. So Sean, Sean Fain, Fain. Uh, <laughs> who's the head of the UAW, he's talked about this. Yeah. So this there's a possibility that this could be – like a this legit could be like a, like a legit strike. general strike, <laughs> yeah. which would be fantastic. I mean, I think that would be great. Yeah. The other thing that would be kind of cool is is that's two weeks before tax day in the U.S., which is April 15th. Ah. So you have like – you mix a tax revolt with a general strike. <laughs> there we're doing Shays Rebellion 2.0 and maybe there we'll win this time. Yeah. Um, that would be fantastic. I mean, I, I mean I'm all for it. Uh, you know, I'm always for like shut this motherfucker down. Like there's nothing yeah. too important. You know, shut it down. Um, so yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. And hopefully I think that, so if that's like a definite thing we know is happening, then we build towards that, yep, you know, yep, right. so if you're in a labor union or you're in a party, like that's what you build towards is like knowing this thing's going to happen. So what can you do yeah. to, to get support to that, the people who to support are, that, who are doing that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. I think that like, that's probably the most hopeful concept about a general strike that I've heard. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I am hopeful about it. I mean, but I think it also goes with, you know, it's got to be that sort of perfect mix and it's not easy to do, you know, no, but that perfect sure. mix of like organization and sort of yeah. spontaneity and following where the masses are going and kind of getting a sense of that too. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I think that unfortunately we've seen, uh, I think a, a, a lot of right wing governments kind of of coming up, uh, and you know it's going to be harder and harder. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, like Biden's poll numbers are abysmal. So like, you know, it, is Trump like being president next year or twenty twenty five? It's a very real possibility. It's not it's not unheard of. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think that you know, <laughs> yeah. So fuck. <laughs> like I just I can't even like I can't even watch the stuff that's going on down in the US anymore. Like it's so it's terrible. Bad. It's terrible. And the thing is, is that like, you know, Canada can be like, yeah, we may have a problem, but we're not oh, the we US. Do. There's no doubt we do. Because Trudeau's on his way out and fucking the only other option is Pierre Polyev. So <laughs> Oh man, it's crazy. So it, I always say it like this is like the Canadians are like, yeah, we might be bad, but we're not the U S and the U S can go. Yeah, we might be bad, but we're not Britain. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because Britain's yeah. worse than both in some respects. The only thing Britain has on us is, is the NHS and they're actively dismantling that. Yeah, so like under the, isn't it, uh, this, this guy that's in charge now, the labor, labor party is like basically right wing. Yes, it is. So Keir Starmer, who's yeah, the leader of the Labour Party, um, it's essentially a right wing party now. Fucking I mean, it's nonsense. it's it got completely and totally co opted by the Blairites. There's not anything he won't say or any promise he won't break to come into power. And unfortunately, because the the Conservative Party, the Tories, is such an utter disaster, he will probably be the next Prime Minister of Great Britain. But like, it's it's not it's not going to be. He's not Corbyn. Like it's. Yeah. It's not – yeah, he sucks. I mean he's basically – he when he was elected leader of the Labor Party in 2019 uh, or somewhere around that, 2019, 2020, he made like a list of like these are my 11 promises to you of like certain things he wanted to do. He's basically reneged on all of those. Yeah. You know, he, I mean – and we all knew that. Like he's a shameless politician. He, he reminds me very much of Richard Nixon, where it's like he doesn't really believe in all that much except for being in power. Yeah. And then it's like just – I mean you just kind of want to sit him down and ask him like the fundamental question, which is why do you want to be prime minister? Why? And just try to he, watch him figure that one out because yeah. I don't have a clue why he would want to be. Um, I just yeah. think he's he's awful. He's totally awful. And the only thing he has going for him is that he's not a Tory. But the Tory – because the Tories are so bad. Oh, yeah. That's right. And that's the only thing Biden has going for him too is that he's not a Republican, which again, not much better. But like it's – you know, I mean like – I mean I think that – I mean I – alone, I mean the thing is is that like just based on Israel-Palestine, just based on this, you know, what's going on, um, the horrific – horrific things that Israel is doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, and the U S is basically complicit in it. Cause we could the stop at any time. The political we class of the Western like country. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Completely are out to lunch on this. Um, and yeah. you know, and, and what does this mean? Well, there's a large Arab American population in Michigan that probably won't vote for Biden. Now they'll yeah. either not vote or they'll vote for Trump, which yeah. means that a very key battleground state may go to Trump. So it's yeah. like, I mean, it's so crazy to think that like Trump is is probably going to win Iowa, and he's probably going to win New Hampshire, the in the primaries next year. Mm-hmm. The only person who might even remotely pick him off is Nikki Haley, and she's not even remotely close to him. Yeah. DeSantis's campaign has been an utter train wreck, which is good. <laughs> yeah, um, but but yeah, I mean, he's not so as confident I, as he looked five years ago or six years exactly ago. or five months ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to kind of wrap up with this book, I mean, I think with all of what we've been saying, I think that the lesson of, of this book is that there are times of, of, of growth, mobilization, and mass politics, yeah. and then that kind of falls into sectarian and irrelevance. And then we have mass politics again, and then it kind of goes back into relevance. I think, unfortunately, I think we're in a little bit of that irrelevance period. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is the time for us to kind of develop and figure out what that next wave of mass politics or left is going to be. Yep. And I think the support of Palestine is a part of that. Yep. Okay. Um, and I and I think that if you look at the protests and you look at the the movements for supporting Palestine against the egregious actions of Israel, yeah. um, and that's in no way to like con- condone what Hamas did to Israel, which was also terrible. And like Hamas is not great. And like yeah. you know, I think if you're on the political left, I don't think you should be celebrating like a far right nationalist political party, like which is what Hamas is like, not a fan, (laughs) not a fan, like, but at the same time that in no way excuses the absolutely egregious and horrific actions taken by the Netanyahu government. I mean, it's it's gross and it was their long-term thing all along. It's what they've always wanted to do. And they got the justification. It's just just like Bush and nine 11. Yep. You know, it's, it's that, you know, it gave them the justification to invade Iraq, to invade Afghanistan, to, do the wa- mass surveillance, the you know wiretapping of Americans without due process, like torture, like all of that. Like it gave them what they what it gave them what they wanted to do, and so did this. Um, and you know, uh, and there are people who are far smarter than me on this topic. Um, but if you're interested in learning more, definitely check out our episode on the question of Palestine by yep. Edward Said, which is a classic book we did early on in the show's run on Red Reviews. And I I, I always like I, I share it a lot in on my. Uh... Uh, in my reading group, 
but there's there's like uh, Haymarket Books and Verso Books and yep. AK Press. These have all come out with free book, free eBooks on uh, Palestine and, yep. and the subject of Israel Palestine. Like, there's lots of good resources out there for people to get access to. Absolutely. Um, definitely check those out. Um, you know, and, you know, or if you're more into like videos and stuff, you know, check out, you know, videos, uh, lectures of Edward Said, yeah. you know, or Ilan Pape, you know, you know, um, you know, uh, I trying to remember her, her name is Norma. It's like Nora Ekrot. She also wrote a book about this too. Oh, okay. But basically there's a ton of people who have been writing and commenting on this and doing very articulate. Yeah. Um, analysis of it that I think is relevant because what we're seeing in real time is, you know, if people want to know like, well, how did slavery happen? It's like, well, it happened because there were tons of people not speaking out. And I think that, you know, there's going to become a point where like the public is not like the broader American, like the normie public is no longer going to support this. They're already yeah. getting to that place. Right. And um, because the United States could stop it like that. We could. Mm-hmm. You know, all we would do is it's you stop this or we cut off aid. Yep. That's it. Yep. That's all we'd have to do. We could stop a lot of this. And the fact that we, it's that easy and we don't do it speaks volumes. But this is but we're but the president right now is also the guy who said in the 90s or whenever that if Israel didn't exist, we would invent it. Yeah. Yeah. So like it's, you know, and so I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I. Unfortunately, I don't think – I mean, I think the mainstream political establishment of both parties has been mostly atrocious on this. Yep. Um, and it's no surprise because I feel like the, you know, the, the hardcore far-right you know, Zionists who are you – know, they're not representative of all Jewish people. Hell, they're not even re- representative of all Israelis, let yep. alone all Jewish right. people. Because I don't even think most Israelis like what Netanyahu's doing. In fact, most of them fucking hate him because not only was he out to lunch on being on them being attacked, but now he's doing all this horrific shit in their name. So it's like, you know, they don't like him either. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of the Palestinians don't particularly like Hamas either because they haven't held elections since 2006. Yep. So, like, yep. it's it's – you have two governments doing awful things to one another and the working class basically saying, what the hell are you doing? You're, you know, like you're destroying our lives here. Yeah. And, and that's not to equivocate because I think Israel is far worse. Yeah. Um, there, there's a, a set far, of people that are getting uh, like actually genocided right now. So. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. I was trying to avoid that word. I didn't know the monetization <laughs> on that. But basically know. like – We're not monetized by YouTube yet anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's effectively a genocide. And, and the fact that we're seeing on the mainstream Western press people saying things like, well, what does the word colonialism really mean? Or what is the word gen- – is it re- – we have to really rethink what genocide means. It's like all of these like Atlantic think pieces by middle-brow fuckwads who think yeah. they know better. And it's like disgusting. It's like are we literally playing like the Merriam-Webster's dictionary yeah, we version gotta of like – got to play semantics games about fucking yeah, what's it's, happening. It's absolutely disgusting. But it's part and parcel with – you know – People often make the argument of like the the you know the Israeli lobby and like APAC and you know Israel controls the United States and stuff like that. I don't really think that's the case. I actually kind of think it's the other way around. I think yeah. that the United States pretty much lets Israel do it at once, um, and Israel is always just kind of like, "Can we get away with this?" And the U.S. is usually like, "Yeah," and then yeah, we don't care. We don't care. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's because you know a lot of it just comes down to the fact that strategically. Um, the United States is wedded to the product of, of, of the project of Israel and has been since 1948. Um, and uh, in some comment, yeah. uh, comment from Velkin, uh, I think a lot about how we cage people at the Southern border and how our children will view that in the not so far future. It makes me think of internment camps for Asians in world war two. Yes, yeah. I agree. And in fact, uh, Velkin, you might, if you, if you, if you already know this, it's fine. But if you don't, that was one of the few times the United States ever actually paid reparations to mm. um, was in the 1980s for uh, those who suffered under Japanese internment. Um, it was actually done under Reagan, which goes to show you how serious people took it. Um, but, but the federal government issued a formal apology 
for the internment camps during World War II and actually provided cash payments to those whose property or businesses were destroyed by the internment policies. Um, yeah. It seems, it seems, I mean, we're getting a little far afield, I guess. We but are. It seems, seems very, uh, I don't know. It seems really telling uh, that uh, that would be an issue that would get attention and would justify reparations. But like slavery of black people was not yes. or does not get the attention and like is refused to uh, yeah. like reparations. And the, here's the thing. So like the argument that people use is that a lot of the people who were who were given reparations for Japanese internment were still alive. They were people who directly experienced it themselves. This is I'm not this is not my argument. Yeah. This is what no, people fair. say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and that's part of it. But I'm like, but that's not good enough because we yeah. know that a lot of these people are children of parents who were in the camps who are yeah. now dead. Yeah. Like so, I'm not yeah. saying that the people who went into camps didn't deserve reparations. I'm just no. saying that, no, hey, it's, I think this it's is relevant. a double standard. You're only <laughs> exactly. Especially since in, in many respects, the United States was apologizing for something where a lot of the people who had been indirectly involved had died, you know, because it was 40 something, nearly 50 years after the fact. Yeah. So, um, so there's that. I mean, the other thing is, so you have obviously reparations for slavery, which I'm very much in support of. I think that's the right thing to do. Um, or at the very least, if we're not going to do like reparations money wise, the very least that we like directly change federal policy to fight against disadvantage, the like fight against inequalities and disadvantagements that right. exist within marginalized communities. The other part of that is, is the way in, in which the United States and its federal government is in relation to native Americans, um, yep. which is, yep. I think another huge component of this too, especially in regards to the sort of school systems that a lot of them were made to go through where they were ripped of their culture. Oftentimes they were under threat of physical violence um, we know, we know, we know the children died in these yep. schools That's right. in the United States and in Canada. Yep. And a lot of times they were done under the auspices of religious organizations or uh, like the Catholic church. And other times they were done under the direct involvement of the federal government. So like the United States has a tremendous amount of crimes, which is part of the reason why People are like, why does the United States support Israel so much? And I'm like, well, they're kind of doing the same project. I mean, the United States is a settler colonial country. It was founded upon the the mass displacement and genocide of Native Americans. Yep. So that's ex what we're seeing right now is the genocide and mass displacement of Palestinians. It's the same fucking project. And uh, and yep. I think that it's that I, I and, and to tie it back to the book tonight. I mean, I think the main thing is is that I think this is a prime opportunity for the left to re-engage in that sense of mass politics and try to make a real difference because I think, and it will be, it will, it will not be too soon. It will always be hopelessly late, but my hope is that um, the tide will really turn on this very much like it did with South Africa. Yep. Um, the people will recognize like, this is apartheid. This is what apartheid is. And in some respects it's worse. Um, you know, this is apartheid. This is Jim Crow. Like, this is what this is. Treating people differently simply by virtue of the color of their skin or their religious organization um, or simply by virtue of where they were born. Yeah. Um, and it's wrong. It's wrong. And the United States cannot sit and stand upon the world and say, we are the moral leader. We stand for human rights while simultaneously giving the most amount of federal aid to one single country to do horrific actions against people yeah. whose only crime was that they were born Palestinian, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and people can say, Oh, well, it's a religious conflict. No, it's not. It's not. not. People say, Oh, <laughs> this goes back thousands of years. Islam's not that old. You know, Islam starts in the you know, fifth, sixth, yeah. you know, sixth or seventh century. It's not that old. Like yeah. this is a political thing. It's a very explicit political project where, you know, the vast majority of the people involved are not religious zealots. Most of them are people just trying to live. Yeah. And it's the religious zealots who are often in power and they're the ones doing what they want to do and using their religion to justify it. So, yeah. Yep. So I guess. Yeah. On well, that, that note. chipper note. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are we going to cover next time? So next time in the new year, new year, new us, I guess, we're going to start with um, 
you know, I think a bit, uh, it's sort of a big picture kind of book. We're going to sort of talk about basic principles and sort of think about humanism in a broader way and how it relates to socialism. There aren't very many books that sort of take the humanism stuff and the socialism stuff and kind of put them together. We're going to try to read a couple of those next year and, um, and kind of blend those. So the first book we're going to be doing um, next time, the book we'll be doing next time is called This Life, um, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom by Martin Hagland. Okay. Um, I'm about three quarters of the way through the book. It's fantastic. Oh, wow. um, he, is, he is a philosopher from Sweden who now teaches in the United States. And he argues for a secular humanist philosophy um, and and argues for his, his own unique form of what he calls democratic socialism. Um, so very interesting readings of Marx and uh and the nature of time and it's it's a very very good book very big picture stuff kind of like tonight um so that's what we'll be doing next time right on i guess all that leaves is where can people find you people can find me at justinclark.org the old website's right down there you can also find you can also find me i don't know why i went <laughs> slipped into australia there for a second you can also find me on social media i'm at uh, justin clark ph ph stands for public history on Instagram and threads and blue cool. sky. Although I'm mostly active on Instagram. Very cool. I guess with that, thanks everybody in the chat for uh, talking with us and joining us. And yes, thank, thank you definitely. for our viewers. And also thank you to our patrons um, who make yes. all of this possible. Yes. Thank you very much for those who support the show. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Even when I don't produce anything for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're all allowed to be human. We're all allowed to be human. Sometimes we get burned out. And, you know, we have oodles of content to keep them busy. That's true. So, you know, there's always something you probably have not watched yet. Yep, so you can right. go check that out. But yeah, good right stuff. On. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Corey. Have a good one. Thanks. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Uh, remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me keep the internet and power on. Thanks to my top patrons. Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. These days, I also have a Substack and a ghost where you can subscribe for free or you can donate a per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities, as well as the other shows that I do. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, make sure to stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat between me and Justin. they're not forced to work jobs they hate if they're not forced into poverty if they're not you know we don't know what people will choose yeah if if they don't you know if if we don't have an abusive society maybe people will choose not to do drugs yeah <laughs> i think so i think if we live i agree with you i think if you if we lived in a society that had universal health care that had democratic control of our public utilities and of our workplaces where, where hierarchies, if they did exist at all, were justified with democratic consent, 
Yeah. And even then they were limited. Um, yeah. That like, I do think you'd have people who would um, do drugs less and that they would have, you know, they, they would maybe not get into sex work because yeah. a lot of people get into sex work. It's out of desperation. It's not out of interest. Yeah. Right. The-